be kind and bless us, be pleased and smile, then everyone on earth will learn to follow you and all nations will see your power to save us. Welcome to worship from Greenlaw Church. Let your spirit fall upon us, Lord Jesus. Let the spirit fill us and move among us and stir our hearts and souls. We know, Lord, that we are far from perfect. We know that you deserve far more than we can ever offer. But still, you promise to stand by us and to work with us and through us. Your willingness and commitment to care for everyone goes far beyond anything we could imagine. And yet our response is at best lukewarm. Forgive us for the way that we take you for granted until things go wrong. Forgive us for not bothering to give you the time and attention you deserve. But above all, forgive us when we allow what doesn't matter to get in the way of what does. Forgive us for the times we become preoccupied with or get upset about little things, things that are really not that important, and ignore those things that are more deserving of our attention. Show us the bigger picture. Help us to grasp the wider vision that you have for our lives, for the life of your church, and for the life of the world. And then, inspired by you, may we go on to live that vision in the power of your Spirit. Transform and renew us and begin right now, as together we pray the prayer which you yourself taught your followers, saying, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
In today's passage, Jesus is giving the disciples some last-minute instructions on the night of his arrest, trying to prepare them for what lies ahead, although they don't quite realise what's going to happen next. Importantly, Jesus tells them that they won't be on their own and they will be prepared, even if they don't feel like it just yet. We read from John's Gospel, chapter 14, from verse 23. Jesus said, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear me say are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You heard me say, I'm going away and I am coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. of Jesus. At this point in the story they are full of anticipation, perhaps even exhilaration. They've got the best seats in the biggest gig in town and then everything falls apart. First one of their own betrays Jesus who's arrested, tried for blasphemy and sentenced to death. The disciples were nowhere to be seen and some even denied ever knowing him. That's a pretty desperate low point. 
But of course I'm running ahead here. At this point in John's Gospel, all that is just about to happen. The disciples haven't a clue what's going to happen next. Not that they haven't been told. Jesus, as he has done on numerous occasions already, explains to his friends how things are going to pan out. At this point, the band of followers had been basking in Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. That seemed to signal that things were finally looking up for the motley crew of his followers. People were taking notice. So excited were they that they didn't really grasp that Jesus chose a donkey to ride on as a symbol of humility rather than of power and majesty. Jesus wasn't playing to people's expectations. However, it took the crowds lining the streets and the disciples themselves a little while to catch on to that. I wonder if you've ever been in a situation where you're about to leave a job and you had to try and persuade someone else to take over from you before you left. You want to make sure that your understudy knew exactly what they were supposed to do. You'd want to try and make them ready for this new role by telling them where to find the resources that they need, introducing them to the people they need to get to know, giving them confidence where needed, and perhaps dampening any unrealistic expectations. Having done all that, you can step away from the job knowing that all is well, and that those you've left in charge can get on with things just fine. This is exactly what Jesus is doing in this long teaching session he's having the night of his arrest. It's only the enormity of the role that lay ahead for the disciples that sets it apart from any ordinary succession planning. Jesus reassures and inspires his followers that they are, despite all they've been through, fear and the confusion, the exhilaration and the excitement, he reassures them that they are up for the job. That's all the more important to realise because of how the disciples react after the authorities have Jesus arrested. I wonder if they remembered those words as events unfolded. Was it something that they could hold on to when all about them was in danger of falling apart? Because the disciples' anxieties would have been very real. They were facing the task of sharing the good news of what God had done without their teacher by their side. It was a very different future that stretched out before them. Some of their questions and comments are heartfelt. A little earlier in this chapter, Thomas says to Jesus, You want us to follow you, but we don't know where you're going. To which Jesus replies, I am the way, the truth and the life. It is, on one hand, as simple as that, on the other, very difficult. But by keeping our focus on the person of Jesus, we, in our day, as well as those first followers, know where we're heading. So in preparing for any such journey, we do need a bit of sustenance, and we'll come back to explore what that might be shortly. My peace I give you, 
I do not give to you as the world gives. I've often wondered just how those words were received by Jesus' closest followers. In the midst of all the bewilderment they must have felt as Jesus explained what was going to unfold before them, here was something that they could really hang on to. In the midst of turmoil, peace is like gold dust. Susan, as some of you will know, was in Ukraine a few days ago with the moderator visiting the church's partners and seeing what they were doing to help in the situation there. In that part of the country they have a greeting. In Hungarian, which is what they speak in that part of the country, it's the words Aldas Bekasheg, peace and blessings. And those commodities in short supply at this time, and sadly not just in Ukraine. So when we think about peace, what is it that we're imagining? Are we like Mr. Bayer in the story, Peace at Last, just looking for tranquility and not being able to find it anywhere in his house? Or is it something more? Jesus is very clear that the peace he's talking about is not what we expect. The word he uses is an old, well-used word in the Bible, shalom. That peace is so much more than the absence of conflict. It's so much more than just a bit of quietness. It's a profound sense of complete well-being. It carries with it the power of God that resists all our tendencies to division and hostility and fear and misery. It's the kind of peace which the world cannot give because it can only come from God. And when Jesus meets his frightened disciples after his resurrection, it will be with a greeting of peace. And in that moment, I believe that the disciples would have felt the wholeness and the acceptance that Jesus talked about. The gift of peace accompanies the gift of the Holy Spirit, which Jesus breathes into his disciples as he sends them out in mission. It's not something bland or something, for that matter, that's easy. It's so profound and so hopeful. It's about a vision of joy and well-being, harmony, prosperity. Jesus sees peace as something which always works for the good of others and always rejects how some people go about life, seeking security and well-being in ways that manipulate other people, another part of creation, another part of the community. Peace is not something that we can grasp by sheer force of will or by our knowledge. It comes about through the hard and costly way of caring, exemplified by Jesus himself. So caring for those around us, the world in which we live, and ourselves, is the way that we should follow. Amen. Lord God, your son Jesus came to us as a tiny baby and he lived among us, sharing in the lives of those he met, and through his teaching, helping them to see the way that they should follow. And our Lord comes to us here as well, sharing in our lives and giving us strength at the very times we need it. Lord, thank you for coming for everyone. Thank you for meeting us here and being prepared to meet those who've very little idea of who you are, never mind of what you've done and what you are yet to do. We ask for the courage to work towards a world and not just a church which is filled with your glory and filled too with the warmth of your presence and your love. 
May we learn to fix our eyes on you and to follow where you lead. And may we also learn to live out the peace that you have promised so that we might be a blessing to our neighbours. As the church meets in General Assembly, we pray for all who attend and we ask for a renewed vision for the church and the energy and desire to be a church that loves and cherishes all who come. Guide all the debates and the decision making so that through all that happens this week, your church in Scotland might be inspired and challenged and that we try hard to follow you, acknowledging all the times when we've fallen short. We pray for the world that the church in your name serves. We pray for the people of Ukraine in the midst of unimaginable violence, suffering and privation. We pray for all in many other places where violence is rife and life seems cheap. Let the peace you promise to leave us with wash away all that comes between people. Let it heal hurts, rebuild broken relationships and challenge and renew your world to live trusting one another and living in peaceful harmony. But come even closer still, we pray, to those who are ill, to those who are mourning, to the broken. In quietness, we think especially of those people that we know. May the warmth of your touch restore them. May your arms embrace them and never let them go. Lord God, let your spirit fall like soft and gentle rain upon each one of us here in this place and wherever we are. So send us from here, certain that you go with us and help us to find you in unexpected places. May the whole of our lives be a living sacrifice of praise to you. So may your name be glorified in us, in your church and in the whole of this world because you deserve all that and so much more. All these things we offer in your name, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen.
May the peace of Christ descend upon you, bringing you hope and joy. And may God's loving arms surround you this day and always. Amen.